All right. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for the introduction. And um, thank you again for the opportunity to present my research here. As you just heard, we are staying in the wider field of statistical mechanics, but are now approaching it from a rather chemical side. So this is a classical computational chemistry project. And um, where we are here interested in the calculation of absolute molecular entropy. I did this project together with Stefan Klimmel prior to coming here to Cambridge for my postdoc. But I, at some point, I'd really like to revisit it here during my stay. So as I just said, we are interested here in a calculation for the isolated molecule and are therefore uh, looking at the partition function for, for su such a system that is typically composed of, of four different components that are the electronic partition function, the translational one that's only depending on the mass and volume of the molecule, and the rotational partition function that in very good approximation can be described by a rigid rotor. So this top row is more or less dealt with. The more interesting and more challenging part are the internal movements of the nuclei and the, their electrons within the molecule, which give rise to the vibrations of the molecule and the associated partition function. For flexible molecules, this can be quite challenging, and there are some approaches that efficiently deal with it, one of which is this uncoupled mode approach pioneered by Joachim Sauer, and in the form I'm showing it here, further developed by Martin Ed Gordon and Berkeley. And what's done here is that for each vibration or mode, you are modeling a one-dimensional potential energy surface, fit a spline function to it, and solve this one-dimensional Schrodinger equation to get the energy levels associated with the mode. These approaches work really nicely, and I'm showing it here mainly because I'm on a later point referring to some results of it. However, from a technical point of view, um, it, it requires a bit of handiwork in setting up the splines and, for example, deciding which of the three n minus six modes to model in this way. Therefore, you could ask yourself, um, is there maybe a simpler way to obtain this, the same information? And there is if you stay in the harmonic approximation of the mode and try to correct the missing anonymity with an informational quantity that is the conformational partition function. Um, these type of approaches have been also around for quite some time and are known under a bunch of different names. I'm calling it here the quasi-harmonic ensemble approach. In its original form, it dates back to a publication from the late 80s from Martin Kaslus, where they introduced it for MD simulations of proteins. What you are doing here is you uh, partition your absolute or approximate your absolute molecular entropy uh, by the uh, translational, rotational, and vibrational entropy of your global minimum from the rigid rotor harmonic oscillator approximation. Add optionally some anharmonic corrections and then this conformational term as cons here, uh, which is further composed of two components. The first being a, uh, a, a mixture of the energy levels in the harmonic approximation. So you are approximating your anharmonic potential energy surface by your discretization. And the second part being a configurational entropy that can be, for example, calculated in the Gibbs Shannon entropy approach. In the past one to one and a half years, we and two other groups uh, published computational protocols that use some kind of, of these approaches. They all follow the basic um, same strategy in that we have these three kernels here. And uh, typically it is not enough to just do one of them really good. You either have to do them all exactly or find a combination of things that, that works well. Um, with regards to this latter point, one thing our approach um, distinguishes from the other two papers I might mention is that on top of, of uh, the scheme, we are employing a multi-level modeling model where only for the global minimum, we are using a, a calculation at DFT level to obtain the translational, rotational, and vibrational entropy. And for the conformational term, we are employing a cheaper semi-empirical or force field level. 
the motivation behind this is really finding a balance between cost accuracy and generality as in the end we are performing thousands to millions energy and gradient evaluations and i'm sure you have seen this type of figure in lena jones center talks before most people here in cambridge would probably put machine learned models here in the middle between dft and traffic four fields but coming from an electronic structure theory um, based group i intentionally put approximations on the x-axis so for us um, the level between DFT and classical force fields are the semi-empirical quantum mechanical methods. You might know a few of these, for example, the PM methods are quite popular and the DFTB level. What we have been developing and using are the so-called DFN extended type binding methods. And due to time reasons, I, I won't go into much further detail here. For those interested, um, I gladly refer you to the review down here that gives a nice overview about these XTB methods. But just to summarize, they are related to the DFTB methods in that they are approximations to GDA functionals, but it differ to DFTB in that we have an elemental parametrization and as such to the majority of the periodic table available for computations. The other selling point is then probably as with all the semi-empirical and force field methods, a rather large speed up compared to DFT methods. What may be a bit more uh, relevant for the configurational entropy is then how to obtain your conformation ensemble. And the end goal you can see as some kind of transformation where you transforming your uh, continuous potential energy surface into this type of step function, the tilde, on which the gibbs shannon entropy is then evaluated. For our generation approach um, or, or protocol, there are many different possibilities. We here employed a molecular dynamics-based um, procedure to get um, initial structures and subsequently optimize the snapshots. And to accelerate this a bit, we are actually referring to a metadynamics based strategy in which you add history dependent um, Gaussian potentials to your simulation that sequently fill up the minima and over the course of the simulation uh, ex um, enable a faster exploration of the phase space. As the so called uh, collective variable we are employing here, we use the Cartesian RSD of our current snapshot in the simulation compared to documented reference structures. And this gives you a nice scalar value that can be used in, in this sense. And uh, the, the effect of one of such Gaussian potential, potentials can nicely be demonstrated on this chloropromopropane molecule where the global minimum is selectively blocked out by one of the bias potentials. Right before I now continue, just a brief summary of what we are then in the end doing. So for the ensemble generation, we are employing this metadynamic simulation run at the semi-imperial XTB level. And for, from the generated ensembles, we are calculating this ensemble average term and the gibbs shannon entropy for the ensemble. What in the end we came then up with is this rather intimidating looking workflow, but I'm just going to point out a, a few key features of this. So we intended to do all of this in an automated fashion to don't require any more user input besides the input structure. After the setup, we uh, run the first batch of metadynamic simulations, followed up by the geometry um, optimization to obtain E tilde. And a really important 14th step in which we distinguish three conformers and rotomers that are the degenerate conformers existing through permutation of equivalent nuclei. As it turns out in the Gibbs Shannon entropy, you only must count true conformers and uh, should not count these degenerate structures. The ensemble is then passed to an iterative cycle in something that we in the paper called static metadynamics, a term you might be more familiar with is umbrella sampling, but using the same um, RMSD potential as in the metadynamics. And we are running this 
until we uh, reach a convergence in the configurational entropy part. If we do so, we can calculate the ensemble average and finally extrapolate a, a final value for the, for, for the configurational part. This uh, extrapolation is merely a technical trick uh, since we can in finite runtime not ensure to find really the whole ensemble. So what we are doing instead is we take the estimated configurational entropies from the iterations and extrapolate it to infinite runtime of the algorithm. This, in the end, will give you, give you a fraction of, of uh, one entropy unit, so really not that much, but it greatly improves the numerical, numerical stability of the workflow. Right, with that, I'd like to show some results, and all of it rather anticlimactically boils down into a single parity graph. Uh, where I am comparing the calculated absolute molecular entropy to an experimental one. And the molecules we are testing for here are small to medium sized flexible molecules up to a few dozen of atoms. If you only calculate um, the translational, rotational, and vibrational entropy at a DFT level uh, for your global minimum, you end with the white points here and an error of almost twice the chemical accuracy. If you add to this the conformational terms here at a polarizable force field variant of the XDB method, you decrease this error by a sixfold and are well within your chemical accuracy. It is in fact so accurate that you could replace the DFT calculation by a um, semi-empirical one and still be within this error range. As promised earlier, um, or part of the set results at the uh, uncovered mode approach level are available. And without going into much further detail here, I'd just like to say that um, despite be, being using a rather simple approach here and um, rather cheap computational levels, we are <laughs> consistently able to uh, beat the error of this theoretical more advanced method. <coughs> Right. Um, it is, in fact, to the best of our knowledge and at time of publication one year ago, um, the best prediction of absolute molecular entropy in the literature um, for, for molecules of these sizes. I don't really know if since then somebody has seriously attempted to, to do better, but my estimate would be that it is possible with enough computation power. As after all, we are doing it here on a budget with really efficient methods. Um, you might then ask, okay, what is the overall influence of the uh, conformational terms and the limitation of the approach? And <clears throat> I can give you two answers for this. So for reasonably flexible organic molecules, think drug-sized molecules, um, the typical influence of the conformational terms will be between 5 and 10 percent. And as for the limitations, it's sensible to look at the most flexible molecules that we can imagine and for which um, experimental values are available that are the linear alkanes. What you see here is that up to a chain length of 14 carbon atoms, we are still basically spot on and within chemical accuracy. After that, uh, differences start to appear. It is, however, um, still better to correct for the conformational terms than not doing it very clearly. So, right. Since I'm running out of time, I keep the next point quite short. Um, so, in a small follow up study, we then wanted to investigate uh, what is the influence of the chemical environment on the conformational entropy. And for this, we compared these conformational terms for a set of molecules that you see here in the gas phase and in implicit correlation. And um, the basic observation in the end is that in line with, chem with your chemical intuition, there is an influence of, of, the, uh, of the solvent. And so some molecule might be more flexible in, in solvation. Others might be um, more rigid. 
um, and you can in part attribute, attribute this to attenuation or quenching of um, intramolecular interactions. But sadly, it's not possible to generalize all of this. So in the end, you will have to try out um, if, what the influence is that formation makes. Right. Um, as an outlook where further research might, might lead to, um, I'd like to return to, to this picture. And what this tells us is basically that the entire approach is systematically improvable. We could naturally choose a higher, le higher level of theory for your computations. You could look at different strategies to generate your ensemble. And you could look at uh, different strategies to obtain the configuration of some. The upper two parts I talked about, there are this other class of approaches that are the marginal entropy approaches, which work on by um, discretization of dihedral angles and looking at covariances to obtain the conformational terms, con <clears throat> configurational terms. And the last point I put down there, and a really nice paper by Geoffrey Hutchinson, I'm pointing here out, it's um, in which they use an empirical function um, with dihedral angle information and basically the information about uh, conformational flexibility to approximate the conformational terms. And this, in combination with our extrapolation scheme, tells me that it should be possible to learn the conformational entropy. So this is definitely something I'd like to revisit here. I hope I could show you that it is possible um, in a simple three-step protocol to obtain really good entropies. The um, accuracy is better than chemical accuracy for the benchmarks that we looked at. Um, and the GFN XTB methods um, enable the application of such um, protocols for rather large system sizes due to the computational efficiency. If you would like to look at the programs we have written for all of this, you will find them on GitHub. I'd like to express my gratitude again to the Leonard Jones discussion group organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, David Wales for um, being my PI and hosting me in Cambridge and all the people that um, contributed in one way or another to the work I've shown today. Primarily Stefan Grimm, who was the PI in that. Funding of my current position is by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and I thank you all for your attention.